you know, every Sunday I am blessed by our music ministry, and I know as we get ready to go into Holy Week, and we'll talk about that at the end of the service, but I'm so grateful for the ways they lead us. In our Reformed tradition, we believe that the, the worship uh, is to uh, get us ready to hear God's Word, and so thank you for that. And I also kind of want to share an exciting thing that happened this week, and uh, Tom and Peter Young and I took a little trip over to see this. This is our new organ. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to have that in our new campus. Um, and so wanted you to see it as we continue to pray. We are very close, and we hope in the next days we're going to be able to tell you exactly our first Sunday. But continue to pray and continue to anticipate the incredible ministry of music that we're going to have in our new space. Amen? All right. One, yeah, but give, give a round of applause. That's great. Well, we were supposed to have a storm yesterday, and of course, uh, around our, our area, there were a lot of storms, and many uh, lost homes, and we need to be praying as Mark just did. But we thought here it was going to be big enough and windy enough to cancel our Easter egg hunt, which we did. We postponed it to at 11, after the 11 o'clock service in the gym. It, it'll be kind of like an egg roll. It's worth sticking around for because 5,000 eggs on the, on the gym floor is, is a funny sight. So if you want to go grab something to eat real quick and come back, it is worth doing. But I expected yesterday that we would lose power at our house. And the great thing about living here in Bethlehem is that when we have a power outage, we can go online uh, to the PPL site and we can actually see where our outages are. Uh, you can get actually a projected time uh, that the electricity will come back on. You can see how many customers are affected. You're, you're you realize you're not the only one who has the power outage. But I, I also appreciate that they tell you why the darkness is happening. See, there's usually a reason for darkness. At the end of the day, we expect the sun to set. We expect there to be darkness. Darkness. At the end of the day, we expect that our laptops will be out of juice and that there will be darkness. And if you're like me, usually I will do anything to run back to the light, to recharge my computer, to wait and anticipate that the electricity will come back on. And even at the middle of the night, when you wake up at four o'clock in the morning, don't you anticipate that the darkness will become light. Well, before we skip to Easter next week, I want us to linger today at the cross and linger in the darkness that came when Jesus gave his life. Luke gives us a very powerful description of the moment when Jesus died and what happened. Luke 23, verse 44 says this. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. For three hours, the crucifixion happened in the light. Jesus would have been put on the cross about nine o'clock in the morning. And until 12 noon, they were set up along the road everyone could see. There were the people who were walking by. There were the soldiers who harassed and mocked Jesus. Everyone could see in the, the bright light of day the pain and the humiliation that Jesus and the other criminals were experiencing. And that was intentional. Rome wanted these executions to be very visible. So the crosses were set up 
along a busy road where people would walk. The cross was meant to be a deterrent to anyone who thought they could rise up against Rome or anyone who was thinking about committing a crime. And of course, also in the bride of that day, there was Mary and John and other followers of Jesus. They could see that morning the agony that their friend and their leader and their son was experiencing. But then the darkness came. Not just a shadow over the cross. Luke tells us that there is darkness over the entire land. And usually there's a reason for darkness. But there was no natural reason for the darkness that day. It was the wrong time of day for darkness. It was the wrong part of the year for any sort of eclipse that would have resulted in darkness. See, in nature, darkness always surrenders to the light. Think the sun breaking into a new day. Think the moon and stars. But that day, the darkness of the cross was so intense that it smothered the light. What an amazing thing for us to consider. In his hours leading up to the the darkness, while on the cross, Jesus actually speaks seven times. But we get only one recorded conversation, and it's between Jesus and the criminals that are on his right and his left. And we don't know a lot about these men, except that they were criminals, arrested And convicted to die for their crime. Some translations render these men thieves. But that's a bit of an understatement. Because you don't go to the cross for stealing. We don't know if they'd ever met Jesus before today. But all four gospel accounts show these criminals One crucified on the right of Jesus. One crucified on the left of Jesus. Tradition actually names these thieves. The one who turns back to Jesus is Dismas. And the one who keeps mocking Jesus is Justice. Now as I read this conversation, I want you to listen in. And if you're following along in your journal, I want you to notice the phrase, Save yourself. Or save himself. You're going to see it three times. And remember, whenever we see repetition, we should stop and pay attention. So here's how Luke records Jesus on the cross. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at Jesus. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah. The chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked Jesus. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above Jesus which read, This is the king of the Jews. Stop there. Even though we know that Jesus is the son of God, Jesus' words jump off that page. In fact, they they ring a little wrong. See, when you are being wrongly accused and wrongly convicted and wrongly crucified, this is not what you say. But Jesus looks at these people, the ones who are putting him on the cross, the ones who are mocking him, the ones who are throwing dice to get his clothes, He says to them, 
And he looks to the Father and says it. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Jesus extends that incredible mercy. But to that, everyone lashes back at him. First time, it's the religious people who mock Jesus. They watch and they sneer. He saved others. Jesus, save yourself. Get off the cross or you are not the Messiah. See, all the Jews, all those leaders who were there at the foot of the cross, they were looking for a Messiah, but Messiahs don't get crucified. The second time, it's the Roman soldiers. They aren't looking for a Messiah, but they know all about power. They know all about kings and emperors. Jesus, save yourself. Get off the cross or you can't be the king. He had that sign above him that said he was the king of the Jews. But kings are powerful. By now, everybody's March Madness bracket is busted. Does anybody have anybody left? I mean, raise your head. We want to just kind of say, wow, good job. None of you. I'm seeing no hands. The final on Monday night, I mean, we expect UConn, right? I mean, that's a powerhouse basketball team. We expect them to be in the finals. San Diego State, who? We don't expect San Diego State. See, there are teams that are powerful, and then there are teams that are not. Jesus wasn't a king if he couldn't save himself, if he couldn't win, if he didn't have power. Then we get to this cross conversation. Seven times he speaks, but only one recorded conversation. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. This conversation is so important. The first criminal is so angry, he hurls insults at Jesus. Jesus, save yourself. Get off the cross if you're the Messiah. So I won't die. Jesus, save yourself and save me. If you don't take care of the need I have in the way I want, if you aren't God on my terms, I can't believe in you. You aren't the Messiah. This criminal misses Jesus totally. He misses the Son of God because Jesus won't save him on his terms. Jesus will save him on Jesus' terms. Jesus won't do what he wants, so this criminal rejects him. Does that sound familiar? He comes to Jesus with desperation. I've done that. But then he comes with demands and insults. Jesus, it's my way or 
you're not the Messiah. You're not trustworthy. You're not my Lord. But then the other criminal intervenes. Before we get to what Luke says, it's important for us, it's not actually recorded in Luke, but at first, this criminal also mocks Jesus. Mark 15, 32, Mark records it for us. It says, those crucified with Jesus also heaped insults on him. So at first, both of them were mocking Jesus. Both of them were insulting Jesus. But something happened to this man. While he could barely catch his breath, when he was about to take his last breath, perhaps it was hearing Jesus ask the Father to forgive the very ones who were crucifying him. I'm so glad we have this part of the story because God can get to us at the last minute. God can get to us at the worst moments. He can show us who we really are and he can show us who he really is. With this change in his heart, the criminal speaks to the first criminal. How can you be saying this? How can you say this? We deserve what we're getting. We deserve the darkness. But this man, Jesus, is innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and he speaks so personally It's the only time in the Gospels where Jesus is addressed without a more formal title like Jesus, Son of David, Jesus, Son of God. He speaks personally and he speaks humbly to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Tim Keller says the first criminal is more concerned to save his skin than his soul. It's a good line. But this criminal sees. He wants to deal with his soul. He knows that he is dying justly. He is condemned. And this one beside him, this one who is dying innocently beside him, shows him what he needs. The man doesn't want what Jesus can give him. He wants Jesus. Instead of asking for the life he wants, he wants Jesus to be his life. See, he wants Jesus on Jesus' terms, not on his own. And how does Jesus respond? He doesn't rehearse All the bad things that this criminal has done. He doesn't talk about why he's on the cross. No, he promises him forgiveness and friendship. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that is Jesus See, from the very beginning of his ministry, he is so consistent. The scripture tells us he came to seek and to save the lost. And even in his dying breath, he's in the business of saving people. That's why he's on the cross. He says, you will be with me in paradise. See, Jesus was on the cross. He didn't save himself so that he could save the criminal. So he could save our sin. So he could take away our sin on his shoulders. So he could die our death. So he could reconnect this criminal with God again. Luke tells us, we read it at the very beginning of the sermon. 
he gives us this great detail that the moment Jesus died, the temple curtain was torn not from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom. Now, why does that detail matter? Well, that curtain in the temple was designed to keep people away from God. That curtain was designed to keep people from the holiness of God. That's where God was. Only one person, one time a year, would go into that room. And that high priest would pray for forgiveness. That high priest would sacrifice for forgiveness every year it was the same. But now Jesus had done it. He gave his life. So the separation between people and God is gone through Jesus. So that temple curtain was torn, not from a human from the bottom, but by God himself from the top. The Holy of Holies wasn't needed anymore. In that moment when Jesus died, he made a way for the criminal to be with Jesus from now on. See, everyone got it wrong that day except this converted criminal. Let's review. First, it was a religious crowd. They said, save yourself, get off the cross, or you're not the Messiah. But by dying, Jesus said, I'm dying on the cross so I can be the Messiah for you. To the Romans. Jesus, save yourself. Get off the cross or you can't be the king. And by dying, Jesus says, I'm dying on the cross as the king of kings. And then the criminal. Jesus, save yourself. Get off the cross so I won't die. Jesus, by his dying, says, I'm dying on the cross so you can live with me forever. See, Jesus refuses to save himself so he can save you and me and the criminal. You know, people have been debating who Jesus was and why he came and why he died on the cross since he came as a baby in Bethlehem. During his ministry, he asked people, who do you say that I am? And now at his passion, where his suffering is at the most intense point, it's no different. Who is Jesus? What is he doing? His sovereignty was a debated sovereignty. One day, it won't be debated. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. But here on Golgotha, on that night, there is so much confusion. Why is the Son of Man, the Messiah, the King, why is he hanging on a cross? Why is he suffering with criminals? Who is this man? Can he really be God's plan? Is he really the Son of God? Is he really the hope for the world? Well, hanging on the cross, it doesn't look like it. These two criminals enter into and they part ways in this historical debate of who Jesus really is. So which criminal are you? It's not a very cheery thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. We are all dying. We're all one day closer to a day where we will take our very last breath. And if, in your, if you're in denial about that, let me pedal a little easier. You know there are things in your life right now 
There are things in your life that are coming that you will not know what to do with. Things that will keep you from the life you want and things that will keep you from God. Some things you do on your own, some things other people do for you. There's lots of things that we could put in that category. Folks, on the cross, Jesus rushed into your darkness. The darkness of your brokenness. The darkness of your selfishness. The darkness of your evil. The darkness of your regret. And your grief. And your pain. Jesus rushed into the darkness of your inadequacies and your your fears and your lies and your doubts and your limits and your shame. See, Jesus rushed into the darkness because he knew you couldn't see your way out of the darkness without him going into the darkness. In the darkness, the Father, God the Father, abandons Jesus. He turns his back. He is not present with his son for the first time and the only time. In the darkness, Jesus dies with the full weight of your sin and my sin, the whole world's sin on his shoulders. This is how Isaiah wrote it. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. The darkness of of the cross is the only thing that can truly meet your darkness. It's the only thing that can bring you into a life-giving relationship with Jesus. See, he's been there, he's done that. And nothing can keep you from him. Nothing can keep him from you. Jesus is at the center. And you're either on one side or you're on the other. Which criminal are you? See, either you'll dismiss Jesus because he doesn't give you what you want in the way you want it and you reject his sacrifice and you stay in the darkness or you come to him in your brokenness and you ask for mercy and you ask for him Knowing that the darkness cannot overwhelm you and you will be with Jesus forever. Which one are you? If you've been dismissing Jesus for a very long time, it is never too late. See, Jesus is not the means to the end. Jesus is the end. Jesus, the day you gave your life suffering on the cross, you rushed into our darkness. You didn't save yourself. You gave your body and your blood. By your Holy Spirit, would you give each of us eyes to see would you help us to come to you on your terms and not ours we admit that we deserve the death that you died we admit that without your mercy we're stuck in the darkness and we cannot receive the life we long for Jesus how wonderful that you stand ready to receive us Even if we've been indifferent or distant or even mocking Jesus. Change our hearts as we take this meal that costs you your life.
Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he was heading to the cross and into the darkness, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. It was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink all of it. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we take this bread and this cup, we show forth the death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Amen. Would you take your elements? And hear Jesus' word to you. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take the juice and hear these words for you. This is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this meal. This meal that uh, allows us to have a heart change. This meal that allows us to say, Jesus, remember me. God, do your work in us. Thank you for coming into our darkness. Thank you for changing our life. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.